Hello, my name is John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. As you can see sitting here next to me is a 2017 Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid minivan. This minivan comes with an all-new hybrid electric transaxle that we've never seen before and we are going to take a look at that transaxle in great detail in this episode. Let's go take a look at it. All right, uh, right here on the bench, I have totally disassembled a 2017 Chrysler Pacifica SI-EVT transaxle. The SI stands for single input. So like most transmissions, there's a single input shaft. Uh, this input shaft is connected through some sort of a torque damper. This is not the one out of the Pacifica. This is one out of another hybrid. The one out of the Pacifica is larger and has more springs, but the, the principle is the same. The, the splines here on the input shaft will connect to the torque damper and rotate this input shaft with the rotation of the crankshaft of the engine, which means this input shaft always turns at the speed of the engine. So if the engine is off, this input shaft is stopped. If the engine is running, it is turning at whatever engine RPM the engine is turning at. The purpose of the springs in the damper assembly here is to absorb the pulsations of the normal engine firing pulses. On a V6, there's typically three firing pulses per crankshaft revolution. So the single input shaft is how the engine's torque is delivered to the transmission and the engine torque can either help propel the vehicle down the road or it can turn a generator motor a inside this transaxle to recharge the 360 volt lithium ion battery or to generate power that is needed by motor b which is the great big motor in this transaxle also known as a traction motor that moves the vehicle down the road We'll get to motor B in a little bit, but for now, let's concentrate on this input shaft and what it connects to and how all of that works in relationship to the rest of the transaxle. Now, you may have heard that on this transaxle, we can use both electric motors to help propel the vehicle down the road. Um, in order to do that, we have to have some method of preventing the engine from turning backwards while motor A is trying to help motor B move the vehicle down the road. So I want to show you the components involved in preventing the engine from spinning backwards. The input shaft that connects to the engine is going to be supported by this bearing support that is bolted to the back of the case. And so I'll set this up in some V blocks here. Okay, the bearing support right here does not rotate. It's bolted to the back of the case. The engine's crankshaft through the spring-loaded torque damper can turn the input shaft just like this. Now the next thing to understand in relation to the input shaft and the and the bearing supports and all of that is right here on the case. We're looking at the bell housing side of the case and right here on the input side where the bell housing is is a great big heavy duty support fixture. Now this support fixture does two things. It has a bearing here on the back that'll help support the counter drive gear. And then it also has this machine surface right here that is the support for what's called a sprag clutch. And a sprag clutch is a clutch that'll rotate in one direction but not in another. And so in order for it to rotate in one direction and not another, it needs to have a good strong support fixture right here. This support fixture fits right through this hole here and is bolted to the case. But for my demonstration, to show you how this one-way sprag clutch works, I'm going to leave that out of the case for now but I wanted you to see where it goes in relationship to the parts we will be looking at. Okay, so I'm going to set this bearing support and sprag support fixture right here on the bench. I'm going to take 
the sprag itself and up inside of the sprag there's these little sprag keys and we'll, we'll take it apart and look at it here in a minute. But I want to show you how this sprag works. So I'm going to very carefully set this sprag down in place on the sprag support. When you, in, when you put a sprag on a sprag support, you have to rotate it to get it to go down on the sprag support. You can't just push it down uh, because the little sprag keys have to tilt off to the side to allow for clearance. So if I hold this sprag support housing from rotating and then turn the uh, sprag then you can see the sprag in action so i'm holding the support from rotating because remember it's bolted to the case and now i'm going to rotate the sprag housing notice it'll rotate in this direction but if i try to rotate it the other way it will not rotate backwards it will only rotate in the one direction. If I try to rotate it the other way, it, it won't. It just locks up. So that is a sprag. Sprags have been around since the mid-1950s. Uh, the first sprag uh, in use in automatic transmission was in a General Motors uh, hydromatic uh, transmission. So let's lift and turn, get that sprag off of there. So I will just take out this little snap ring. There's the ring. And then we pull out what's called a lubrication dam. Right here. Sprags require a lot of lubrication to keep them from failing. And that's because they have so much surface area. Okay, so now you can see down inside of the Sprague assembly itself, and you can see little individual Sprague keys. Here's one, here's one, and so on. Now there are two cages. There's this inner cage right here, and then there's an outer cage. Okay, I've removed the the sprag cages and the sprag keys as you can see here as i rotate these cages opposite directions of each other these sprag keys right here will lean sideways they will tip they will tip sideways and the inside diameter of the sprag will get larger if i rotate the sprag cages the other direction then it tilts the sprag keys more vertical and they stand up and get taller which makes the inside diameter of the sprag get smaller and that's when it will lock up and prevent the sprag assembly from rotating in the in the wrong direction so if i bring this support in this cage would sit right over the support itself and these keys will physically grab that support and lock itself up and keep it from rotating if you rotate it in one direction. If you rotate it the other direction, the keys lay on their side and allow it to rotate freely. When you reassemble a sprag, you must put it back in the same orientation that it was when you took it apart. If I were to put this in upside down rather than right side up, upside down, right side up, the sprag would then rotate in the incorrect direction. It would prevent the engine from turning in the proper direction. So there's a paint mark right here on this one that I noticed when I took it apart that was facing up when I removed it. So to reinstall one of these, you've got to go around and on every single key, push the key back in back in place while keeping a little down pressure on it here we go just like that we'll put our lubrication dam back in place and put our snap ring back on all right so let's let's put it back on here and make sure it rotates in the proper direction 
this sprag should freewheel and rotate in the same direction as normal engine rotation, which would be clockwise as viewed from the, the front uh, of the engine. So here's the front of the engine. We're looking at the sprag spinning clockwise. Uh, we want to prevent the engine from spinning backwards, so we want it to lock up if we try to go counterclockwise, which it does. Okay, now that we've got the operation of a sprag figured out, let's see how that works in relationship to the input shaft. Now, this hybrid transaxle design is new to Chrysler dealerships, but it's, but it's far from a new design uh, of a hybrid transaxle. I mean, there are things that are unique to, to the Chrysler design here. I've got three different Ford hybrid transaxles right over here that look almost identical to what this one uh, is. I've got a new Toyota Prius uh, transaxle just across the shop right here that, that looks like it operates the same way, the same layout. Obviously the parts aren't interchangeable and so on, but the principle of operation uh, on all, all of these uh, are the same. So the input shaft on uh, the Fords, the, the, the Toyotas, is always connected to a planet carrier. So this is a planet carrier of a planetary gear set. So every planetary gear set typically will have three pieces. You will have a sun gear, which would go in the, in the center here, and the sun gear on this transaxle for this, what's known as a power split device, uh, planetary gear set is connected right to motor A. So this sun gear right here is the sun gear for the power split device um, planetary gear set. And so it has an electric motor that runs the planetary gear set. The input shaft that connects to the engine and turns it crankshaft speed is connected to the planet carrier on every one of these designs. And then there's the ring gear or the in internal gear, which is the third piece of our planetary gear set that uh, connects through the counter drive gear to the counter driven gear and, and the final drive. Uh, and we'll talk more about the power flow a little bit later. But the point is, there are, th there are three pieces of the planetary gear set, whether it's the Ford, the Chrysler, the Toyota, uh, every one of them have the planet carrier connected to the engine, the sun gear connected to an electric motor. Uh, they might call the motor a different name, but this is motor A here on this uh, Chrysler transaxle. And then the ring gear or internal gear uh, connects to the rest of the, the transaxle. On the other transaxle designs from Ford and, and Toyota, the input shaft is solidly connected to the planet carrier. But I want you to see that I can rotate the input shaft inside of the planet carrier right now, and there is no direct connection. It's just got a bushing um, that it fits up inside there. Uh, and normally these will turn the same speed, but it can slip and turn if there's excessive torque uh, involved. In order to make the input shaft connect directly to the planet carrier as it should, we have to connect it through a great big torque limiting clutch pack that fits in here. So let's take a look at that next. This is the torque limiting clutch pack. It has a snap ring that holds it in place, a really thick backing plate, and then six alternating steel fiber steel fiber steel clutch discs and then a pretty thick apply plate and then this clutch pack is applied with a beveled spring rather than a hydraulic piston like on a regular uh, automatic transmission so this spring right here is going to always apply this clutch pack and try to keep it from slipping now what would slip? If we look at our planet carrier, it has teeth on the inside of this clutch drum right here that all of the steel plates, notice they have teeth on the outside of them, all those steel plates are going to spline into and connect to the planet carrier. But all of the fiber plates here 
are going to spline onto our sprag assembly. Now there's one more missing piece of the puzzle that we need to see before we put the, the clutch plates uh, in and the sprag in and that is that here on the input shaft there is a little sprocket looking piece right here that splines to the input shaft and always turns with that input shaft. The same sprocket looking gear piece also fits into our sprag assembly. Just like that. And then there's a snap ring that holds that in place. So we've got the snap ring holding that little gear in place. Now our input shaft splines directly to our sprag and is connected solidly to the outer cage of the, the sprag itself. And so that whole thing is going to sit right in here and turn together with the input shaft. Now this same sprag assembly fits down inside of our planet carrier. Okay, so let's put the whole thing together. The sprag, the, the planet carrier, the clutch pack. The first thing we install is our dished plate spring plate and then we will put the sprag assembly down in on top of that and then our thick apply plate that the spring will push against to squish all of these clutch discs together and make the discs and the plates spin as one one assembly so then we'll just alternate still that splines to the outer housing fiber plates that spline to the sprag and we'll just keep doing that until we get all six sets installed and then our thick backing plate that everything gets pushed against and then it has a snap ring that holds it in place but we can't get that snap ring totally seated yet because that dished plate down inside is trying to compress everything up against this snap ring. So we have to take it over to the arbor press, use a, an adapter to press down on all of this and get it installed. Now I've installed the snap ring down as far as I can get it without compressing anything, but then I'm going to use a clutch return spring compression tool here in the arbor press press it down far enough to finish getting the snap rings in place okay I've got the planet carrier with the sprag with the torque limiting six fiber clutch disc clutch pack in here all as one big assembly once again the purpose of the torque limiting clutch is to limit the maximum amount of torque that can be delivered from the engine to the transmission or from the transmission back to the engine. There's a certain maximum amount. If we exceed that maximum amount, then this clutch will slip. And what will slip is the, the input shaft, our single input shaft, that now splines up inside of here. This whole assembly now with that clutch pack applied spins as one one piece but if the torque is exceeded then the input shaft can turn at a different speed than the planet carrier assembly itself okay so this entire setup is sitting inside the transaxle uh, just like this and our engine torque damper assembly spins the input shaft our planet carrier then rotates any time the engine is, is operating. Okay, now let's throw in one more piece. This is kind of a complicated uh, setup here. On the Fords and the Toyotas, the torque limiting clutch is 
built into the flywheel and the torque damper assembly. They don't have it inside the transaxle like on this one, but they do have one. Um, so that complicates this planet carrier uh, here a little bit. And then the one-way Sprag on the uh, Toyota, it's in between the flywheel and the engine block. Uh, on the early 2005 Ford Escape, it's on the planet carrier very similar uh, to this one as far as the Sprague assembly itself. Um, all right, well, let's take our Sprague support, our bearing support assembly here. And now we can take the planet carrier and slide it down over it. And notice the planet carrier will rotate in the direction of normal engine rotation, but it will not rotate the opposite direction. Now we can take our input shaft, get it splined into the planet carrier, and now we have the entire assembly as far as the input shaft, the sprag, the sprag support, the bearing support, the planet carrier, and the torque limiting clutch, <laughs> all here as in one assembly. If you'll recall, the, the bearing support does not rotate. It's bolted right to our case right here. So I'll hold it from rotating. Our engine will rotate the input shaft forward in the clockwise direction but the transaxle cannot rotate it backwards. If we try to rotate it backwards, it won't rotate. It just locks the sprag assembly up. So that is the one-way clutch, one-way sprag uh, assembly. There are, there are many different one-way devices. There's sprags, there's roller clutches, there's ratchets, there's springs, there's all kinds of um, one-way devices. This particular one is a Sprag. Sprags are known for being very strong. They have a lot of surface area making contact with that Sprag support, but they also require a lot of lubrication uh, to keep them uh, from overheating. Okay, well, that is our single input. Now we've got the electronic variable portion of the transaxle uh, to look at next our single input shaft is centered by this bearing and this bearing is held in place with a little snap ring. All right, I've got the bearing and the snap ring in place so that our input shaft can spin inside of our bearing support. Okay, we are going to take our bearing support, sprag support, bolt it into the transaxle bell housing it has a it has an arrow pointing up to align the the bolts properly There's an O-ring on this sprag and bearing support that will seal and keep oil from uh, coming out. All right, I'm not going to torque these bolts. Um, this is a training transmission. It'll be apart and back together many times. But you can see our bearing and sprag support is bolted in. Our single input shaft uh, can rotate freely. Uh, by the way, I put a few extra bolts in the bell housing side here to act as spacers to prevent damage to the differential uh, seal here. So now I can lay this down and have a flat surface. Uh, to work on. You can see our input shaft sticking through right here. And here's our sprag support. All right, let's reassemble the rest of the, the gears, the electric motors, and get them in this bell housing side of the case. 
There's a selective shim right here that goes on top of the bearing for what's called the counter drive gear. This counter drive gear right here in this surface area right here is going to sit right on this bearing that's part of our bearing and sprag support assembly. So I'm going to set that down on there. There we go. So this is our counter drive gear. When motor A, the electric starter motor generator uh, assembly uh, rotates, it's going to end up eventually turning this counter drive gear right here. Now the counter drive gear meshes with a counter driven gear. The counter drive gear has 69 teeth. The counter driven gear has 70 teeth. So it's just a very slight underdrive uh, gear ratio there. Um, but before I can put the counter driven gear in, we have to put in the final drive differential assembly here. It has an oil slinger that fits down inside the case. The final drive here has a giant ring gear as far as width of the ring gear. It's a, it's a little over seven and a half inches in uh, diameter. Um, it's a regular open style differential and it has an additional gear right here on the top that drives a mechanical oil pump so that anytime the vehicle is moving down the road, this gear will be turning and driving a mechanical pump. There's also an, an auxiliary electric pump uh, in here for when the vehicle is stopped. Um, okay, so there's a great big ball bearing on the back right here. A big heavy duty uh, unit, which we would expect for uh, a, a minivan uh, like the Chrysler Pacifica. So I'm going to set this differential case and ring gear down in. The gear ratio of the um, final drive here is 3.588 to 1. Uh, it has 61 teeth on the ring gear, 17 teeth on the counter drive gear, The this portion right here, the equivalent of a uh, pinion gear on a ring and pinion gear set. All right, so we've got the final drive gear in. Now we've got the counter driven gear, or as Chrysler calls it, the transfer gear. Fits down in here next. Just like that. So if we turn the counter drive gear, the counter driven gear turns, that turns the equivalent of a pinion gear on a ring and pinion gear set that turns the final drive. Now we have another couple of pieces uh, to install. We have what's called the parking gear. These teeth right here are what a parking pawl will come in and engage and prevent this gear from rotating. That parking gear prevents motor B from rotating and motor B meshes with the transfer gear or the counter driven gear. And so if we stop motor B, we also stop the transfer gear and the final drive. So let's bring in motor B. Motor B here has a drive gear with 27 teeth on it and it will fit, and it has some splines right here that will fit right into that parking gear. Just like that. All right, so if we can stop that parking gear from rotating, then it stops the vehicle from moving. So next up, we have the parking pawl assembly and linkage. This piece right here is the parking pawl that goes into one of the teeth on the parking gear and prevents it from rotating. So I've got some linkage that connects to some external linkage here that's controlled by a electric motor. And then we've got a couple of dowel pins 
and a spring to hold the parking pawl away from the parking gear. So right here is our parking gear that is rotating. Right here is the parking pawl. And notice that if I engage the parking pawl, it stops the parking gear from rotating. So now I will disengage the parking pawl. And then I'll put the cover and the detent on that hold it into whatever position it's the electric motor that controls it wants it to be in. Okay, the next thing on our list is we still need to install the planet carrier and the internal gear that are part of the power split uh, planetary gear set. So the planet carrier with the sprag goes on next. And just like we saw earlier, it'll rotate in the normal direction of engine rotation, but not in the opposite direction. It'll rotate clockwise, but not counterclockwise as viewed from the, the bell housing side. Okay, then we've got the, the internal gear. And this, this goes right on top of all of this. And there are eight bolts that hold that together. All right. Then we've got a snap ring that is going to hold the planet carrier up just a little bit inside of all of that housing. All right, to install the snap ring, I'm just going to reach in find an oil lubrication hole and lift up on the planet carrier assembly. Get my snap ring in place. All right, we've got the snap ring holding the planet carrier to the power split ring gear and motor a drive gear or counter drive gear assembly. So the last part to come in here is the motor a assembly itself with its sun gear for the planet for the power split device. I mean, the bearing support and the input shaft support assembly that comes through from the other side of the case would fit right here and give support to motor A as well as that input shaft uh, that we looked at. And then motor B has a similar bearing support in the back of the case for it. Let's look at the power flow here uh, for this, this transaxle. First, this is a parallel axis uh, hybrid electric transaxle, um, which I mentioned before is just like Ford has been using since 2005 uh, Ford Escapes and, and clear up through brand new Fords today. Uh, the 2016 and above Toyota Prius uses a parallel axis uh, hybrid transaxle and now the 2017 uh, Chrysler uh, Pacifica. They both have two electric motors. What they call the motors might be different, but the function of the motor, what it physically connects to, is exactly the same. The gear ratios might be a little bit different, but what each component does is the same. So motor B on this transaxle has 113 and a half horsepower or 85 kilowatts uh, of power. It is known as the traction motor. And what that means is if this motor moves at all, so does the final drive gear and so does the vehicle. So if you want the vehicle to move down the road, the engine does not cause this vehicle to move down the road. Motor B causes the vehicle to move down the road. So if motor B rotates, the vehicle moves. Now to move forward down the road, I've got an arrow here, forward vehicle movement. This motor has got to spin clockwise, the same as the internal combustion engine, as viewed from the engine side of the transaxle. 
Um, it has a gear ratio of 9.304 rotations of motor B to one rotation of the final drive, which is connected through your CV shafts to your hub and bearing assembly, to your wheels, to your tires. So your tires spin the same speed as this gear is what I'm saying. So for every one revolution of your tire, this motor B makes 9.304 revolutions. And with 113 and a half uh, horsepower, that's, that's fairly decent. I do not have the torque ratings for these motors. Uh, maybe if uh, some of you guys know uh, what they are, if you could put them in the comments, comment box below down here in the video, uh, let me know what they are. But whatever the torque rating is for this motor, we could multiply it by 9.304. And of course, we would need to subtract... Uh, probably 5% or so for frictional losses for gear contacts, but uh, that would be the torque delivered to the, the wheels. Um, so let's say we had 100 pound-feet of torque uh, through motor B. I don't know what it is. It's just I'm picking 100 because it's a nice, easy number. We'd multiply one, 100 by 9.304, and we would have 930 pound-feet of torque uh, to the road, uh, maximum with uh, motor motor B rotating and driving the vehicle down the road. Now I suspect it's higher than that. Uh, most of the uh, Toyota ones are higher than that. I don't have the torque ratings on the Ford ones, but um, since the Pacifica van is is a big van, it's it's going to need a lot of torque, and and that's I suspect it'll be higher. All right, motor A over here. The purpose of motor A is not to move the vehicle down the road under most conditions. This is the generator that when it rotates uh, will generate electrical power that is used to help motor B move the vehicle down the road. Any excess can be used to, it'll, it can be converted from the AC, three phase AC voltage to a DC voltage and used to charge, recharge the uh, lithium ion battery uh, in this vehicle. Um, so motor A is a generator, but motor A also can start the internal combustion engine. This is the starter for the internal combustion engine. And as we saw earlier uh, in the in the video, motor A connects to the sun gear of the power split device. The internal combustion engine hooks to the planet carrier, and then the ring gear. Uh, connects to the uh, counter drive gear, counter driven gear, and the and the final drive over here. So by rotating motor A with enough speed differential versus the ring gear, we can crank the engine over and and get it to start. Now there are certain conditions where motor A can help motor B move the vehicle down the road. This is not totally unique to uh, Chrysler. Uh, the 2005 Ford Escape did that, the 2016 and above Toyota Prius Prime plug-in hybrid vehicles uh, do the same thing. And the Pacifica minivan is a plug-in hybrid vehicle. So when you're in electric vehicle mode, we can use motors A and B under certain conditions to propel the vehicle down the road. In order to use motor A to help motor B propel the vehicle down the road, we would have to turn it in the opposite direction of engine rotation. If we were to turn motor A uh, counterclockwise here, which is the direction it needs to turn to uh, help motor B move the vehicle down the road, it would also want to turn the engine crankshaft counterclockwise, which is backwards. And that's where that sprag assembly comes in and it stops, it holds the engine crankshaft from turning backwards, which allows motor A to turn the sun gear, the planet carrier doesn't move at all, and the planet gears turn the internal gear or ring gear of the power split device, which forces the uh, counter-driven gear, the counter-drive gear to rotate and send power to the final drive. So in other words, there's two torque paths uh, when we use motor A and motor B. Motor B applies torque to the counter drive gear or transfer gear here 
over here through its gear teeth. Motor A through the power split device and the counter drive gear connects to the counter driven gear right over here and helps that counter driven gear turn which moves the final drive gear and moves you down the road. But once motor A starts the internal combustion engine and you're in the hybrid mode driving down the road, then we use the rotational speed of motor A versus the rotational speed of the engine's crankshaft to vary how much engine torque gets delivered to the counter driven gear and the final drive. Because we can have as little as no engine torque being delivered to the uh, final drive uh, with the engine off to a, a high amount of engine torque being delivered through the power split device planetary gear set here and delivered right to the counter driven gear so we can control how much engine torque kind of like a continuously variable transmission or infinitely variable transmission we can control how much engine torque is delivered to the final drive gear to help move the vehicle down the road to help motor B move the vehicle down the road by varying the rotational speed of motor B versus the speed of the crankshaft now if we happen to turn motor A and the crankshaft in the same direction and the same exact RPM then it's possible that we would have a one-to-one -one gear ratio with the engine crankshaft and at that one point we would have the maximum amount of available engine torque being delivered to our counter uh, drive gear but only under that one condition so if we speed the motor up or slow it down we can increase or decrease the amount of engine torque delivered um, let's look at a couple other things uh, while we're here on the uh, on these motors on the tops of the motors here we have the resolver rotors themselves so there's resolvers in this transaxle and the purpose of a resolver is to measure the rotational speed which way it's turning its direction and its position as it as it rotates uh, these resolver rotors have four uh, cam lobes on them now older hybrid transaxles uh, from toyota originally had two uh, some of them have four uh, the newest one has five and what it has to do with is are, is the number of magnets in these rotor assemblies these rotors are permanent magnet uh, rotors uh, as you may have noticed there's anything uh, magnetic that comes over here and gets next to it wants to stick to it and you want to avoid that the the best you can the purpose of the resolver rotors is to let the computer in charge of controlling the speed and direction of these motors know where those magnets are inside of these rotors now i have not taken any of these rotors apart i don't know if the permanent magnets in there are just a single bar magnet coming down like uh, the original toyota prius or if they're in a v configuration uh, or some sort of a haulback ring or loop uh, a more sophisticated design um, i could probably take one of these apart but then i doubt that i would be able to get it back together and i, I don't want to do that um, so the fact that there are four lobes on here tells me that there are eight magnetic poles uh, around each of these uh, rotors so there's usually two for each one uh, of the lobes now those magnets in the rotor assemblies line up with electromagnetic poles in the stator assembly this is the stator assembly for motor a it's the smaller one there's a much larger one right over here for motor b and so those resolver rotors and the resolvers themselves are used so that we know which of the three phases the uv and w phases to use at the appropriate moment so that when the permanent magnet pulls in the rotor uh, come around we can activate the appropriate stator circuit to create a magnetic field that pulls it around uh, and makes it makes it rotate if we got that out of synchronization it wouldn't rotate as efficiently as it should or, or maybe not 
uh, rotate at all. Now those stators sit up inside of the back case half. This transaxle has two case halves. That's it. It's a two-piece case uh, rather than a three-piece like uh, the Toyotas and the, and the Fords. So we will look at the back half of the case next. Okay, we are looking at the back half of the case now. Um, this would be the driver's side outside of the case. This is the front of the case. On the front of the case here, there is an oil level check plug area. So here on the front of the case, there's two, two plugs. You just take the upper plug out and then there's a special 90 degree dipstick that you stick in. Uh, you make sure that the fluid temperature is between 30 and 70 degrees Celsius, which is between 86 and 158 degrees Fahrenheit. The dipstick is measured in millimeters and each increment is approximately 0.1 liter. And so you bring it up to the zero uh, millimeter point to make sure that the fluid level is full. Uh, the fluid used in this transaxle is the Mopar eight and nine speed uh, transmission fluid. This is that green colored translucent fluid that they use in the eight speed rear wheel drive uh, transmissions and the nine speed front wheel drive uh, transaxles in, in Chrysler uh, vehicles. All right, um, let's see what else we have here on the case. On the upper angle portion of the case here, uh, we have pass-through uh, connectors for the two sets of three-phase uh, cables for our stators. And so there are six holes here, three for each uh, stator. These holes would be for motor A, these holes would be for motor B. And then the inverter assembly, the power inverter module, bolts right to the top of the case. And we'll take a look at that uh, a little bit later. All right, we've got a transmission fluid cooler that's going to bolt right here on the, the side here. We have transmission fluid that'll come out of this bottom hole, go through the cooler, and then back into the upper hole. And the fluid in this transaxle is to both cool the stators and the rotors and to lubricate all the bearings uh, and gears. All right, here on top of the transaxle, we have a place for the transmission vent uh, to screw in. This is a very large vent. I've, I've never seen one uh, larger than this. A big heavy steel vent. And then we have a hole for the pass-through electrical uh, connector. And then on the bottom of the transmission, we have a hole down here for the drain plug. Uh, other than that, uh, there's a few plugs in the back here that are uh, plugs just for holes drilled for, for lubrication and cooler transmission fluid to go through and get to the different uh, stators and bearings and gears throughout the, the transaxle. This case is so lopsided that it doesn't want to stand up on its own. Uh, so I've hooked uh, kind of an engine support uh, bracket to it and I've got a big tall jack stand right here that I'm going to hold the case up with as we assemble the pieces inside of it. Okay so inside the case here uh, we are going to assemble a number of, of different things. The first thing we are going to concentrate on are the oil pumps and then the passages where the fluid goes to help cool and lubricate uh, everything. Uh, right down here to the bottom of the case, there's a single bolt that holds a bracket with a magnet uh, in place right next to the drain plug uh, to gather any metal filings that uh, may appear over, over time. So we have two oil pumps. Okay, our first oil pump is a mechanically driven trochoid pump. And the outer rotor fits right in that hole. inner one right there. And then we have the oil pump body that has a overpressure valve right here. If the pressure were to get too high, it just blows it back off into the transmission uh, case. And then we have 
a transaxle filter right here that plugs right into the oil pump body. Uh, this filter is not serviceable without, of course, completely disassembling the, the transaxle to get it out. All right, then on the back of the, the pump housing here, we have a pump drive gear that's going to fit right there. And it has a flat spot on it that is going to fit into the flat on the Girotor pump. So I'll put that in there right now. And then we'll set the pump body over that. Get it lined up. There are a couple of bolts that will get started that hold that in place. All right, so you can see the, the pump drive shaft sticking out right here. That pump drive shaft is turned by a mechanically driven gear here. If you recall on the final drive assembly, it had a small gear similar to this that had 53 teeth. And then this driven gear right here has 46 teeth. So this gear will go on here a little bit later and, and it has a nut that holds it in place. But we can't put this gear on yet because it gets in the way of getting to a bolt that holds our counter driven gear uh, bearing support in place. All right, then we have for our second uh, oil pump an electric oil pump. It's called the auxiliary pump. It's a three phase pump and this uses a trochoid uh, pump with four lobes rather than a, a gyrotor uh, pump. And then there's a cover that covers that up and a couple of bolts. And then on the bottom of this adapter here there are two O-rings that seal the auxiliary pump to the pump body over here. And then we have three bolts that hold it in place. I'm going to temporarily put this gear on uh, for this demonstration here. Um, when either of these two pumps run, so the mechanically driven gear, which will be pumping whenever the vehicle is moving. And then we have the auxiliary electric pump here that will come on uh, as needed, determined by the computer. Uh, typically it would be when the vehicle was stopped or at low speeds or at higher uh, stator temperatures that need additional cooling. Um, these both of these pumps send fluid to two different locations. Um, one location is it sends it through some passages in the back of the, the case and then back right out into the center of this big post right here and this hole right here. Uh, this hole over here is where that input shaft bearing support fixture sits and so that's going to bring lubrication fluid up to the planet carrier and the the sun gear and the ring gear in our power split device to lubricate those gears uh, it's also uh, sending it to this long uh, post over here which is a bearing support on one end for the great big motor B that moves the vehicle down the road, but then it also sprays oil all the way through motor B to the motor B drive gear uh, and bearing uh, that it is centered in on the other side. So the motor B drive gear and the counter driven gear get some lubrication uh, off of that. So that's one of the two paths that these pumps uh, send fluid. So that one path that we just talked about is for lubrication. So the other path is the fluid is sent to the front of the transaxle here and it comes out this bottom hole right here. 
where we have a heat exchanger. This heat exchanger can be a transmission warmer when the transmission is cold and it can also be a transmission cooler when the fluid is hot. So here on this heat exchanger we have antifreeze coming in. It absorbs the heat from the hot transmission fluid and then transfers it uh, out to the radiator to uh, get cooled. Um, on its on its way out, I believe it goes through the power inverter module on top of the transaxle as well. One of these, and I can't tell which one it is from the, the service information, would be coolant in and the other one would be coolant out. Now on the back side of the heat exchanger here, we have two pipes sticking up with O-rings on them. Those are going to go into the transaxle housing itself. The fluid coming from the oil pumps goes into this bottom one and comes out the top top one over here. Now there seems to be right here some some sort of a thermostatic bypass valve which is pretty typical on a lot of transmissions. There's some sort of a, a valve in there and I tried to take it apart but I could not uh, get it to come out. But if it's what I think it is uh, it's just not going to let the transmission fluid uh, circulate through the cooler when the the fluid temperature is too cold. So maybe this does not act as a transmission fluid warmer. Uh, maybe it's just a transmission cooler because there's something with this valve here, but I can't find any reference to it in any training publication or service information that I have access to anyway. So if any of you know what that valve is for, put it in the comment box down below here on the, the video and, and let me know. So now we are going to bolt the, the heat exchanger transmission cooler right to the, the case just like that it just has four bolts that that hold it in place all right so we've got the transmission cooler installed let's turn it here on its side and we can see where that fluid goes once it it's finished uh, with the cooler okay so when the fluid comes back from the cooler it comes into this passage right here which is deep. It goes clear to the back of the, of the transmission. It goes all the way to the top up here and fills up this entire chamber with fluid. Right below this chamber is the motor A stator assembly. So the purpose of this chamber is to cool motor A stator assembly. And then it also provides a little bit of lubrication. There's a hole right here. Okay, there's a hole right here where that cool fluid comes into this passage right here. And this passage has four holes that exit that passage. There are two, these two holes that you can see right here, and they go to the back of the case to cool the motor A stator windings in the back of the case. And then there's two holes one right here and one right here where the fluid comes down and drips on the stator windings on the front of the motor A stator. So we have these two holes that cool the back windings, these two holes that cool the front windings of motor A. So that entire circuit is for cooling and then it just comes back down to the bottom of the transmission case where it goes back through the filter and and starts over. All right, now you might be wondering how do we cool M motor B uh, stator? Uh, motor B stator uh, gets hot and it needs to be cooled also. So on the back of the case, some of those lubrication channels that we talked about that fed fluid here also feed fluid right here. There's this little hole that squirts out, um, that squirts fluid out that would be for bearing lubrication for this bearing right here. But then also right here, right here, and right here are additional holes where 
fluid will come down and cool the front the front and rear of the motor B uh, stator assembly off of that lubrication uh, circuit. So it looks like this, this, the main circuit that we talked about first was mostly lubrication, but it also gives us some motor B uh, stator cooling. And then the other route that goes through the, the cooler in the front goes to motor A cooling. Motor A uh, apparently runs hotter since it acts as a generator and is uh, having large amounts of current. All right, let's install the uh, plate that keeps all that fluid where it should be up here in the, in the transaxle case. There's also right up in here, a little baffle to keep fluid from going out of the vent. So we'll put a plate up here. There are two bolts that we'll leave out right now that we'll need uh, later for the resolver wire harnesses. Okay, so there's our oil plate and our baffle uh, installed. So now the next things to install would be the resolver assemblies uh, themselves for motor B and for motor A. This is the resolver assembly for motor B. Uh, as you can see here, it has three twisted pair uh, sets of wires. There are three coils of wire in here. Uh, one of those coils has a high frequency voltage applied to it that induces uh, current and voltage into the other two coils depending on the, ro the rotational position of the resolver rotor on the top of those uh, motors that we looked at. So these bolt down inside here next. These can only be installed one way unlike most of the uh, Toyota uh, resolvers that if you removed the Toyota resolver uh, it would it could cause you some problems uh, because there was no way unless you marked the relationship of the resolver to the case to know where it would go back in but these just bolt in in one position only so that's a really good thing And then we install our bolt in the oil tank plate. Now we have our resolver connector waiting there for the main harness to be installed. So now let's install the motor A resolver. So the motor A resolver and that input shaft uh, bearing support are both held in place with the same, same bolts. Okay, so now we've got our motor A resolver uh, installed. All right, next uh, thing to be installed is the internal wire harness. It has a pass-through connector that goes through the top of the case right here, and then a clip that holds that in place. transmission vent is in the way of putting the clip on. That's why I had the vent out. <laughs> All right, we've got the clip on, put the transmission vent back in. So the internal harness has these little plastic clips that hold it in place. They just push into the bracket holes. And 
And then we've got our uh, auxiliary transmission pump connector and connector position assurance clip. And then we've got our resolver connector for motor A and our resolver connector for motor B right there. We only have two connectors left inside here and this is for the stator uh, temperature for motor A and the stator temperature for motor B. Okay the next thing to install are what are called the pass-through uh, connectors for the three-phase cables on motor A and motor B to go through the case through these holes right here and then connect to the power inverter module assembly that bolts to the top of the transmission. So these just come right up here and fit down through these holes. And then they have some little screws that hold them in place. On the top of the transaxle. There's O-rings on these pass-through connectors that seal, the, seal them to the case to keep any oil transmission fluid uh, from coming out. All right, now that we've got the pass-through connectors installed, we can install the stator windings next. I've gotten ahead of myself, which occasionally I do, uh, by putting the oil pump in before putting the stators in. Uh, apparently the, the stator for motor A is not going to clear the oil pump housing right here. So I've got to take the uh, oil pump, oil pumps, back off, put the stator on, and then put the pumps back in place. Okay, now with the oil pump removed, I can install the stator for motor A. All right, then we've got some connections here for the three phase windings. Now before you connect these up you want to make sure that they're good and clean. Get some contact cleaner, uh, electrical contact cleaner. Don't touch it with your fingers. Don't have greasy oily hands. Um, and make sure it's absolutely clean and dry when you put these in um, and, and torque the bolts to spec. Otherwise you can end up with a poor connection that'll cause a voltage drop that'll rob power from your transaxle. Now I can put the oil pump back on. All right, now the next and heaviest <laughs> part of this uh, reassembly is the uh, motor B stator assembly. Make sure our temperature sensor is out of the way. I forgot to connect our motor stator temperature sensor A up. We'll do that here in a moment. And now let's set this stator up in place. It's slightly out of rotation. I haven't gone too far. There we go. Okay, let's hook up our temperature sensor connector right here for motor B. There we go. And for motor A. Okay. And then our three phase cabling for motor B. We've just about got this fully 
assembled um, as far as I'm going to assemble and I'm not going to put the two case halves together and put the electric motor rotors in and both the case together because I want to keep it apart for uh, my students to see. The last piece that has got to go on here is the bearing support fixture for the counter driven gear. So that's this piece right here and it's going to partially cover so of course our motor rotor would have to be installed for this to work out properly but it's going to partially cover the motor A uh, stator assembly big heavy duty support fixture All right, there's one more bolt that goes in here, but I'm using it to help hold up the transaxle uh, in the back over here. Uh, I'm not sure what the thread pitch is on these bolts, but I couldn't find one uh, to substitute. So now that we've got that in place, we can put our mechanical pump gear on. As you can see, it covers up the bolt hole, it covers up the bolt that holds the transfer gear support in place. Now the transfer gear support has a trough right here where it's going to gather oil and it'll come down and come out this little groove right here to lubricate the preloaded bearing of the counter drive gear or, or transfer gear um, and keep it lubricated also. Okay let's turn the transaxle sideways here. Just this back half of the the case from what I've uh, measured is um, a little over a, a little over 100 pounds um, so it's it's a pretty awkward uh, case to be uh, flopping around um, normally when you put one of these transmissions together you would put everything in this case half first all the gears, rotors, everything, and then just set the other case half over the top of it and be done. Um, but for my, my classes, we're going to leave this uh, open. All right, now our power inverter module is going to bolt right here to the top of the transaxle. So let me go get that next. So this is the power inverter module. As you can see here along the bottom of it, we have the same six connections, electrical connections, that you'll have right here on the, on the top of the transaxle. So this is going to bolt right onto here, and then we just have uh, some six little bolts that go through there and, and connect these pass-through connectors to the power inverter module, the rectifier, the IGBTs and, and, and all of that that are used to control um, the motors. But while I've got the power inverter module separated here, uh, let's take a look at a few, few things. We have um, a connection right here. There are two holes right here. This is our uh, DC connection to the battery, the high voltage 360 volt lithium ion battery. So here's the positive post, the, the negative post. Uh, there is a fuse in here for the uh, air conditioning, electric air conditioning uh, compressor because this also controls that. And then it has a high voltage interlock circuit uh, right there where if somebody removes this plate to, to gain access to these electrical connections here, it'll disable the high voltage system on the vehicle. So that's the interlock circuit. Um, right here, this orange connector is the air conditioning system compressor uh, connection where we have the vehicle harness and the external transmission harness uh, that plug in right here. On the front here, as you can see, there are two coolant hose uh, connections right here. So the same coolant that goes through the transmission cooler comes up and goes through the power inverter module and to cool its electronics uh, as well. Let's set this power inverter module up on the top of the transmission. There's a gasket to 
keep moisture out of the connections. It goes right there. And then the power inverter module sits on top just like that and it has five bolts that hold it in place okay looking at the top uh, connection here between the power inverter module and the transaxle three-phase cables there are these bolts that are in a little plastic clip that go down in and make the connection between the power inverter module and the pass-through connectors. So we've got three sets of those that would be installed. Once those are installed, then there's a plate that would go over the top right here. And then on top of that plate, we have a high voltage interlock circuit that when it plugs in it completes the interlock circuit and allows the high voltage circuitry on the vehicle to work but if you were to unplug this as in trying to unbolt the power con power inverter module then it would disable the high voltage uh, system so there's these high voltage interlock circuits all over the uh, vehicle on the battery the power inverter module um, anywhere that you could get in and tamper with uh, high voltage circuits they have these interlock uh, connectors that when you unplug them it just opens a series circuit and uh, kills the uh, high voltage circuitry all right um, from what I can tell the power inverter module is a replace as an assembly only uh, unlike uh, some of the Toyota uh, inverter modules where you can go in and replace individual uh, pieces but who knows over time uh, that may be a possibility uh, in something like this all right, what leftover parts do we have? Oh, okay, to get finished up, the last part I wanted to show you and to, in to install is the part Paul actuator. Um, as we saw before, when we move this piece of mechanical linkage, we can put it in park or take it out of park. There's just simply a, a computer controlled electric motor that does the same thing. So to install that, it just has three bolts that hold it in place. There's a little pin that sticks through the linkage right here. And then the bolts come in from the bottom and we've got a washer and a circlip right here. that hold it in place. Okay, well, <laughs> it's quite the transaxle. Um, pretty heavy. Uh, I think it's right around 270, 280 pounds with all the individual pieces that I've weighed. Um, it is a more narrow transaxle than the for any of the Fords or the uh, Toyota transaxles. Um, not by much, but it is a, a really narrow but tall, of course, uh, transaxle, which lets it fit into some small uh, engine compartments. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see this in a hybrid uh, vehicle, not a plug-in hybrid, but a, a hybrid. Um, but who knows? Uh, maybe they'll just be more uh, plug-in hybrids, or maybe this is all we will ever see out of this transaxle, um, but I, I doubt that. All right, well, thank you for watching. Have a good day.